My name is Deidre Teagarden. I'm the executive director here at the Nisei Veterans Memorial Center. And on behalf of all of our board, our staff, we want to welcome you. And thank you for being here for a very special East meets West uh, with Dr. Patrick Patterson, who flew in from Oahu this morning to do this talk uh, for us. The, I'm going to call upon the gentleman who introduced us to Pat in just a moment, uh, Scott Kikawa. He, um, Scott is, a, is also a good uh, friend of the center and he will be doing the honors of introducing Pat Patterson. We met Scott a few years ago during COVID when we were doing uh, when we started our Afternoon with the Author series. And Scott has been back twice with his book, uh, Kona Wins, and his more recent book, Red Dirt, of which we have a few copies over there. And I think he's already signed a few books for people today. Exact, Brian Moto, thank you. You're a very good, a very good Vanna White. <laughs> um, but it's a great relationship that we have with Scott. Uh, we love his books. He loves our archives and we love all of his friends that he introduces us to. And he has recently joined our Nisei Veterans Memorial Center Ohana as our program's co-chair. This is an unpaid position, uh, but we do compensate him with root beer floats from Cupid <laughs> after our talks. And uh, Dr. Patterson, we promised to give you a, a root beer float uh, today as well. Um, but please help me welcome Scott Kikawa. Well, thank you, Deidre, and thank you uh, to the NBMC for having me back. The uh, Stanley Izumigawa Resource Center is probably one of my favorite buildings anywhere. Uh, it's brand new, smells like a new building. It's air conditioned and it's full of nice people. That's in contrast to where I work for a paycheck, which is air conditioned, but it's not full of nice people. Uh, in fact, it's, it, it, it's, pretty, it's I, I'm in law enforcement. Uh, so that kind of explains uh, um, that. Uh, that uh, so this is a welcome contrast. I'm gonna introduce my good friend, uh, Dr. Pat Patterson. And I'm gonna start by reading the description uh, of him that may, many of you have probably already read. I'm, I'm just going to read this again because I think it's really great, uh, but it says a lot about who he is. And then I will talk about my personal experience uh, in relationship with Pat. Patrick Patterson's biggest claim to fame is as the first person to export American-made ice cream cones to Japan, which beats by a whisker his having appeared in the first Pokemon Sun and Moon TV commercial. And he was one of the first to translate early parts of Death Note, the manga into English. Having settled down from an exciting life as a model and manga translator to help raise two now grown children, he is currently a professor of history at Honolulu Community College and an adjunct professor of Asian studies at the University of Hawaii at Manoa where he specializes in East Asian popular culture and history. In 2018, he published Music and Words, producing popular songs in Japan, 1887 to 1952, a book about the inception of Japan's recording industry and its first great pop song composer, Nakayama Shinpei. Professor Patterson teaches a course titled Beauty, Advertising and Desire in East Asia and co-teaches another titled Korean and Japanese Popular Music and Society at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. He is currently working on projects involving transnational celebrities in Asia from 1920 to 1947 and on the relationship of journalism and storytelling to culture in Japanese newspapers between 1868 and 1926. Having met and talked with contemporary K-pop, J-pop, and Inca singers and musicians, Professor Patterson is investigating the phenomenon of city pop in an effort to understand the relevance of older music to younger generations. He also just loves to talk story. And I know this very well because we end up doing it uh, quite often, uh, maybe more than a little more than once a month because he lives about two and a half blocks from me. Uh, 
Pat has been my good friend and neighbor for many years now, uh, more than two decades. Uh, he, he was introduced to me by our mutual friend, Dr. Jason Chun, who you will also have the pleasure of listening to one day. Uh, he's, uh, he's an expert also in Asian pop culture and uh, concentrates uh, on diverse subjects from uh, manga uh, to anime to uh, pop music. Uh, Pat is not just a national expert in his field, he's a world expert. Uh, his work has uh, garnered attention, not just from the US mainland, uh, but from overseas, from Asia. He has helped me with my own work. Uh, he accurately pointed out, he's one of my beta readers, uh, was one of my beta readers for my very first novel and for my second novel. And my first novel, I had opened the first chapter, what was the first chapter uh, in my first draft with the protagonist trying to find an Enka tune on the radio. And Pat accurately reminded me that Enka did not exist in 1953, uh, to which I'm very grateful. Uh, and this was an education for me. I didn't know that Enka is actually a modern form of Japanese music. We, we have come to think of it as an older form. Uh, even someone as old as I am uh, had thought of Enka as something my father listened to, which made it antiquated uh, to my years. Uh, but really, it's, it, it's not been around for all that long. Uh, he told me that Kaio Kyoku was a better choice, which is more Western based, which is what I stuck with. And, uh, and truth be told, uh, which, was, uh, which is a form of music that I probably prefer to Enka, uh, which has caused a lot of family arguments uh, where I'm from. But uh, he has, uh, he's read most of my chapters uh, with a very critical eye and has kept me honest in terms of a lot of the details that have gone into my own writing. Pat personifies, I think, East meets West, not just with his own personal background, uh, but also because he has spent a career in making the East accessible to the West. And he's gonna do some of that for you today. So it, gave, it gives me a uh, great pleasure to introduce my, one of my best friends of many, many years, Dr. Pat Patterson. Wow, so the man who was just introduced to you is not here today and you're going to have to deal with me instead. Um, I, I don't know this, this person, but thank you for, for all of that. Um, what a great honor it is to be invited here to the Nisei Veterans Memorial Center. Um, this is just really important to me um, to be asked to come here and speak about Japanese culture to a group of people for whom I have so much respect. And so I wanna say thank you to Deidre and the center and to all of you for coming here and listening to me talk about pre-war popular music in Japan. Um, I gotta say, I never expected an audience like this for my particular topic. Um, so thank you for, for coming. Uh, I, I wanna start, I guess, just by um, introducing the, the subject that I brought today. Um, I titled this whole talk, Sunrise on the Harbor of Habu. And that's actually a kind of a code for what we're thinking about today. Um, the most, or one of the most famous songs by Nakayama Shinpei is, um, are we okay there? Oh, okay. Okay, so is that visible? Okay, great. Um, one of the most famous songs that really makes Japanese popular music in the pre-war period is a song called uh, Habu no Minato, or the Harbor of Habu. The Harbor of Habu was written about sunsets on an actually existing harbor near, um, near Tokyo, a little bit to the south, um, near the Izu Peninsula. Uh, the problem with that song is that while Nakayama Shinpei wrote a beautiful tune, his lyricist, um, very famous Noguchi Ujo, wrote the words from the, for the song, never having visited the city of Habu. He wrote them based on a postcard that someone had sent him 
from Habu. So he described the bay and the ocean and all of that. What he didn't realize was that Habu actually faces west. And so the sun never sit, sets on, on the harbor of Habu. It always rises, okay? So this very romantic song is a complete inaccuracy. Um, and this to me sort of encompasses what we're talking about here. Because when we think about Enka, uh, and not just Enka, but Japanese popular music as a whole, we think about Japanese popular music as being something sort of innately Japanese. And what I wanna say to you is, it's actually really international and it's not really Japanese. So if you meet someone who says, you can't understand Inca because you're not Japanese, don't argue with them because it will never end. But you'll know in your brain, in your mind that, uh, that you actually can, uh, whether you're Japanese or not. So transnationalism, that is music crossing borders. And what's really interesting to me about early 20th century popular music globally is that it works um, across borders, that music developed at roughly the same time um, everywhere we go. And I like to show this picture of these two Japanese girls. This was taken in 1925. Uh, I took it off of a magazine that I inherited from my father-in-law actually um, about the 20th century in Japan. But these two young women, um, in 1925 are sitting in a modern house with Western style curtains, a Western style window behind them. They're sitting on a sofa, which is not a Japanese piece of furniture. They're both wearing kimono, uh, but they're also both listening to headphones. Headphones in 1925. This tells us a lot about the global nature of popular music in this period. They have headphones. Japan is as high tech as anywhere else in this era. And uh, what are they listening to? Well, they're listening probably to this song. This is, um, this is uh, Dry Grass on the Riverbank or uh, Sendo Kota, which is the boatman's song. Um, and I'll just play 20 seconds. <laughs> So words by Noguchi Ujo and uh, song by Nakayama Shinpei. Okay, well, after that 37 seconds, you can tell what the song is about. In fact, the very beginning lines of the song is, uh, I am nothing but dry grass on the riverbank. And you, and in this song, he's talking to a woman who does the same job of steering a boat on the river. Uh, you're also dry grass on the riverbank. You can tell from the song itself, I think, that this song is about poverty that it's about normal people living in Japan um, and people who are doing a tough job, which is transporting goods and people on the river. So this song is not essentially Japanese music. <laughs> okay. And I'll explain why in just a second, uh, but that's what these two girls would have been listening to. So I'm going to try and move on here. There we go. Did that work, Deidre? Something about this presentation. I don't know what I've done, but I deal in centuries and decades, not in technological stuff. So forgive me. Um, so what happens here is that um, Japanese popular music, as we know it today, started to develop in the late 19th century when uh, this gentleman up here, Isawa Shuji went to the United States. He went to Boston. He went to the United States because he was an educator. He was working for uh, the Japanese Ministry of Education, which had been established by fiat, by a law in 1872. And they sent a group of people to Europe and the United States to learn about modern educational systems in order to begin the process of modernizing Japan. Uh, and that's a long story all in, in and of itself. But Isawa Shuji is really ambitious. He's a member of the, of the education ministry. He played trumpet in a military band um, before trumpet was really commonly known in Japan. So he knows a little bit about music. 
He shows up in Boston and he's looking for a way to make a name with the education ministry so he can move up, get a good salary and a good reputation. And he finds this gentleman over here on the left, uh, Luther Whiting Mason. Mason was really important in the Boston School District at the time. He had just developed a new method for educating children about how music works, teaching scales, teaching notes, uh, teaching the basics of music in a very simple way involving um, flashcards and posters and that sort of thing. So he saw a hooked up with Mason and said, I love what you're doing. Can you come to Japan and help me figure out how to do it in the whole country of Japan? Mason agreed to do that. He went there, he worked for a year. Turns out Mason didn't really like Japan, but he, he helped to revolutionize Japanese music. And in fact, one of the things Mason does um, should I count this down? I'm going to start that video right in the middle. Okay. So he brought this song. You may know it. Okay. What's the song? Okay. So Auld Lang Syne in America, it's a Scottish song. And he didn't change it at all. But in Japan, it's known as Hotaru no Hikaru, and it's incredibly famous. If you go to Japan, in fact, this is taken um, from, I think this was the 1993 Kohaku, the, the Red and White Song Contest, that they do every New Year's Eve. Uh, and if you go to Japan, most people who you talk to in Japan will not know that this is a Western song. For them, it's a Japanese song. And it fits perfectly because what Mason and Izawa did was talk to a bunch of Japanese musicians, classical Japanese musicians, gagaku musicians. And they came up with a realization that there was a way to make Western music sound kind of like Japanese music. And by chance, this song and a couple of others had that basic five note scale that sounds very Japanese. So all Lang Syne was easy to accept for Japanese listeners, but it didn't need anything but new words, which, Isawa provided for it. And they put this into a new school songbook and started teaching children based on these Western songs with five note scales. Um, so that's the basis of Western music here. And then Isawa went on to establish this famous place, which still exists if you go to Ueno area today in Tokyo, you can see the Japanese um, University of the Performing Arts. Uh, Isawa started it out as the Tokyo School of Music, but it's still there. Uh, and it was established in the 1880s to teach mostly Western music. It didn't start teaching Japanese style music until the late or the early 20th century. And it led to a number of famous Japanese musical composers. They did not at the Tokyo School of Music teach people to play these instruments. We have uh, up here on the top left, uh, many of you who are interested in Japanese music may be familiar with these shakuhachi, koto, uh, the wooden fish, which is a rhythm kind of instrument. And there's a, a part of a shamisen uh, right there. There's also a, a, a biwa or a pipa, right? This center circle shows us that many of these instruments are actually Chinese instruments imported to Japan with their sounds changed slightly and developed over time. In fact, China's Tang Dynasty was sort of the um, highest point of Chinese popular, Chinese classical music. And after that, it declined to the point where it's almost unrecognizable in China today, but it still survives in Japan and in Korea using instruments that have evolved over time. And of course, on the bottom is, is koto, uh, which again, many of you are familiar with. None of these instruments are interesting to the people who teach music at the Tokyo School of Music. None of them. That's what's really interesting here. Um, this is traditional Koto musical notation. And I'm sure you can all read that as well as I can. Especially those of you who play, anybody play Koto here by any chance? Oh, I, it's something I've always wanted to learn, but I know that I can't read this. Um, this is, Sakura, this is a song that you probably all know. And Sakura was never written in this. Sakura was written in this. Western style musical notation. And in fact, the koto was retuned 
to match the cyclical and tonal systems based on Western piano tones. So what you hear today when you listen to a koto, especially a 25 string koto like the one you see here, is not what koto sounded like before 1868. It's a modified tonal system. And it was modified by a guy by the name of, um, uh, of uh, hold on a second, my brain is going crazy here, um, Miyagi Michio, who spent time in Korea, as well as in Japan, studying Koto. He learned Koto in the Tokugawa period, near the end, as a traditional Japanese Koto musician. That is, he was blind. And because he was blind, he was a member of a special social category in Japan who were allowed to perform for money and they were subsidized by the Tokugawa government. The problem is, as the Meiji Restoration arrived in 1868, the Meiji government did away with both the category and the subsidies, leaving Koto players, and Shamisen players, and Shakuhachi players and anybody else who was a blind musician and subsidized out of money and out of work. And the only thing these people knew how to do was play music. So they had to find a way now to guarantee audiences before they could go play for an empty room and they'd still get money. But after 1868, they had to play for an audience that paid. And so they began modifying their music and changing their tuning and using methods that help things sound a little bit more modern, which in the case of the Koto was Western. So this song is what we call Meiji Shinkyoku or Meiji New Songs. And almost every Koto song you hear today is actually a modern song written sometime after 1902, even though you believe it was written in 1531. All right, that's the trick. So here's a few seconds of Sakura. You know this song. So there it is, right? It's no flats. It's A, A, B, A, A, B, A, B, C, B, right? That's what it is. It's a Western style song written to sound like Japanese music. Um, in the United States today, we have a term for this. It was created by an American designer, a guy by the name of Lowy, who came up with this idea, of what we call Maya, that is most advanced yet acceptable. But Japanese in the Meiji period were doing exactly the same thing. What they were doing was mixing Western music because by using this system, you make it possible to play shamisen, koto, piano, and guitar all together on the same song. You make it possible for all of these people to tune and interpret the music according to that one system instead of everybody having a different one, right? So what we're doing is we're making it sound Japanese so that new listeners can hear it, but we're also making it sound just modern enough that it's exciting and new for them and it draws in new audiences. And that's what Meiji Shinkyoku is really all about, is drawing in new audiences to make money. So here we have a new thing too, right? Western capitalism is also a part of the deal. So we're mixing scales, we're mixing musical systems, and we're not yet mixing instruments. Um, we blend scales. This is, um, wow, I don't know why that happened. Um, this is just a system whereby, no need to really worry about all of this other stuff. Uh, what we do is we take these Western scales, most Western scales, if you play the piano, you know, are seven notes, eight notes if you go the full octave, right? Um, and to make them sound Japanese, the simplest way is what Izawa and Mason did which is to reduce the scale to five notes by removing the seventh, or the fourth and the seventh note. And any scale you can do this with and it will sound Japanese. So I'm just gonna play this whole thing. Can we do that? Okay. And you'll hear the scale. So this is called the Yonanuki scale. Here's the Western scale. Just 
just a C major scale. Now here's the Yonanuki version. Can you hear the difference? And this is only by removing two notes of the Western scale to make it sound Japanese while also being able to write it in the Western style. So by retuning instruments and changing scales, we've come up with a new system that allows us to play Japanese music on Western instruments. And here's one of the key differences. If you really like Enka, Enka today often uses Japanese instruments, but Kaio Kyoku in the pre-war period almost never did. Almost never. And yet it's still used often, not all the time, these Yonanuki scales to make Western instruments sound Japanese. Um, we also have a recording industry, and this is one thing that um, I have discovered over the last several years, but um, many people have written about it. Technology happens simultaneously. Now, I don't know about you guys, I, I grew up in a small town in rural Oregon. So I sort of assumed that technology was always something the United States was sort of ahead on, right? That was my own cultural arrogance. But when I realized what's going on here, this is a Japanese design for an Edison record player. This record player was built less than six months after Edison invented his. It was built by an English engineer who was living in Japan, who read the description, not, not saw blueprints, but read the description of Edison's machine in a popular science magazine article. He built a record player and then his Japanese friends saw it and built theirs. And within less than a year, you had record players being built domestically in Japan and they needed music to play on those. So we have the, the simultaneous development essentially of technology, recording technology in Japan. And then interestingly enough, when you have the technology, you also have the people who are there to make the music to put on the records. So we have the three key people here. Um, and I have to tell you, these people have so much respect for me. Uh, on, on the left is Hattori Yoichi. He um, is a Japanese or was a Japanese composer, uh, very popular during the 1930s, 1940s, and 1950s, uh, wrote Tokyo Boogie Woogie, for example, uh, and several other songs that you may already have heard. Uh, he learned a lot of his craft in Shanghai from Chinese and American jazz musicians. So we have transnational exchanges of technology, music, and musical ideas going on with him. Nakayama Shinpei is my guy. He's the, the guy right in the middle. Um, my, my book is about him. Don't go out and buy my book. I'm sorry. I hope that, uh, that Lexington Books is not listening to this. It's way too expensive. Um, it's designed for university libraries, but um, if you want maybe small pieces of it, then send me an email and I'll be glad to uh, hook you up with those. But Nakayama Shinpei started composing in the 1920s after going to the Tokyo School of Music, learning to compose classical music. Uh, he decided he wanted to make money, so he started composing popular songs. And uh, you've heard almost all of his popular songs if you've ever been to Japan, and probably even if you haven't, right? If you've ever been to Japan, um, you can hear a lot of his songs just sort of on the street or on the train or just play everywhere. Um, in fact, Habu no Minato, the harbor of Habu, the song I played at the beginning is his. The words are someone else's, but it's his. And then this is Koga Masao, who came to Hawaii in 1938, by the way, who um, helped to found Club Nisei, which is a, a phenomenal uh, band, a big band that plays in Hawaii, Japanese standards, mostly Koga Masao songs. And he directed them at McKinley High School in 1938. Then he went to California and he met executives at NBC Radio who actually played his music on the radio internationally. Uh, in 1938. He was absolutely thrilled to be played on American radio in 1938. Um, but it's this song that really changed the world. And I think if you listen, you can hear Tokyo, you can hear um, the, the five note scale, you won't hear Japanese instruments. This is Tokyo March. Um, this is the first song in history to tie up both a movie and a popular song for dual marketing purposes. That wasn't invented in the United States, it was invented in Tokyo. So this is a great song. And this, by the way, is uh, this is the, uh, the guy who wrote the music for it, whose name will come back to me in 
seconds flat. So again, I can't play too long these songs, even though this one's finally out of copyright, but um, the song is exciting. It's about Tokyo. It uh, is a march style, so it gets you moving and kind of dancing, which was his idea. Uh, it's about two lovers who never actually meet each other because one's taking the train, one's taking the bus, and the song kind of tours around Tokyo. It was used as the theme song for a very sad movie that has nothing to do with those things uh, about a young woman who grows up and, and is forced to be a geisha by her mother because her mother is dying and she doesn't have a father and she has no way to make money for herself. So she becomes a Tokyo geisha, uh, a geisha in the Japanese sense, not the American sense. Uh, and she becomes the favorite entertainer for this bank executive. And um, in a, a series of very scary scenes, she finds out that the bank executive is actually her father. And her mother was also a geisha and his paramour, right? Well, what she finds out later on is that the guy whose tennis ball she saved while he was playing on a tennis court above her little hovel, um, and he became her boyfriend. Um, she finds out that he's actually the son of the bank executive, who's her father. They were in love with each other. Now they can't be in love with each other. And so uh, she gets married to this guy's friend and he goes off on a world tour and she breaks down on the dock, right? Nothing to do with the song, but it's, uh, it's a really interesting film. And it creates the same tropes that you see in lots of anime uh, and lots of other uh, Japanese novels and TV shows. So um, Tokyo March is, is revolutionary, uh, as is um, Nakayama Shinpei himself. Kogama Sao, uh, Nakayama, by the way, is one of the people who applies all of these American and Western musical ideas to Japanese popular music. Kogama Sao, on the other hand, um, grew up in Korea. His mother um, also divorced early on in her life, and she moved her family to Incheon, where um, Koga grew up as a young boy. He learned to play the lute there. He learned to play guitar there. He heard a lot of Christian music, Western Christian music in Korean churches from Western missionaries in Korea. So he came back a huge fan of guitar and lute, was an extremely skillful uh, string instrument player and ended up working in Japan for Columbia Records, where he revolutionized Japanese music again, making it sound, well, if you've ever heard Enka and you think you hear Spanish guitar, that's the effect of Kogama Masao. You do in fact hear Spanish guitar. He put that into his songs. Uh, this is one of his most famous ones. In fact, this is the one that NBC broadcast for him. This is Sake wa Namida ka Tame Iki ka. Um, sake is sake, tears or sighs. And it's a, it's a very famous song that is considered a, a kind of uh, pre-Enka tune. And there it is. Right, the multi-tonal guitar. All of this comes from his musical education in Korea. So very transnational. <laughs> This is Western operatic singing. By the way, the same guy who was singing the first song. So I mean, it's only a few words, but is sake tears or sighs? The song in my heart, and then he goes on and on and on about. Uh, it's it's a very sad song. It includes no Japanese instruments, but it does use a minor style of that five note scale I mentioned earlier. So this is Koga Masao. Koga Masao and um, Hattori Ryoichi were, were heavily influenced by jazz, which came to Japan mostly through um, cruise ships who employed Filipino bands. 
And there were two centers of jazz in Asia in the 1920s, Shanghai and Manila. Okay, in fact, Filipino jazz musicians turn out to have been some of the best jazz musicians in the world and played regularly in the 1920s and 1930s with American jazz musicians in jazz clubs in the United States. And since the Philippines was technically America, because after 1900, after 1898, uh, of course, the Philippines was an American colony. And so Filipinos had American citizenship, although they didn't have the right to vote. And they could come to the United States easily. They could learn to play, but they also had a relatively inexpensive salary. So they could play on cruise ships that, and, and were employed by Japanese. They often then were hired out of the cruise ships into Tokyo where their jazz became really famous. And Japanese jazz musicians learned from them and played in coffee shops. But in the war period, um, jazz was not cool. Jazz was enemy music, jazz was American music. And so the Japanese musical system created a system of sort of self-censorship. The government did not actually directly censor Japanese music. What they did was directly sponsor a group of composers and artists whose job it was to watch each other in order to protect their freedom according to their charters, right? In order to protect their freedom to write music, they sort of helped each other to write the correct kind of music. But this also meant that they could kind of push the boundaries a little bit. So while they couldn't play jazz, they could play light music. And it was jazz. It was just lightened up. The, the lyrics and the themes were made more Japanese, uh, a little bit less syncopation. It was supposed to sound less American. Um, and this is known as light music. So Hattori Ryoichi and Koga Masao sort of grew up learning to compose light music. And Hattori um, took this to Shanghai during the war years where he learned from Chinese and American jazz musicians who were playing in Shanghai in the 1930s and then after. Uh, and he learned Oogie Woogie, he learned uh, syncopated jazz, he learned American blues, blues scales, et cetera, and he applied those to his music during the war years. One of the great things for Hattori was that Shanghai, even under Jap Japanese occupation, was um, really a pretty free place. There was a lot less censorship of music. And so he could play sort of what he wanted. Um, he brought that back to Japan after the war. He also wrote songs for um, the Manchurian Film Company and for Shanghai Film Companies who made movies starring Yamaguchi Yoshiko. And these movies were often just really good movies. And often they were what the Japanese government called policy films, which were designed to make Japan look really good in the eyes of China and everyone else. Um, one of the most famous, maybe the most famous of those films is Shina no Yoru or China Nights. And if you go to Southeast Asia today, People know this song still, and they love it. Eventually it came out and she was, um, she has five names, Yamaguchi Yoshiko. No one knew that she was Japanese. So uh, we can talk about this all you want, but this is her um, on the left. This is after she had come back to Japan. Uh, and you can see that she was very glamorous kind of person. This is her in the middle in China Nights. She was actually 18 when she was discovered and started singing uh, in musical films that were done by uh, Mane or the, the Manchurian Music uh, and Film Company. And then on the right here, this is after she was discovered by um, a couple of major Chinese popular music composers who found that her formal opera training and her beautiful voice lent themselves quite well to what they called yellow music, which was popular music at the time. This is not a, a derogatory term. They called it yellow music. Um, and yellow music was Chinese popular songs. So uh, these that you see here are six of the seven great singing stars of China. And right in the middle, right, right here, this is Yamaguchi Yoshiko, except she was known there as uh, Li Xianglan in Japanese because no one knew that she was actually Japanese. She was known as Li Kora. And no one in Japan knew that she was Japanese because her parents had emigrated to Manchuria 
at the very beginning of the, uh, the occupation and her father taught Chinese. So she grew up speaking almost perfect Manchurian. And then she was discovered and educated in operatic style singing by a Russian emigre and a Japanese friend of hers. Um, and she also had a Jewish friend who comes into the story later, but no one knew. And so when she signed with the Manchurian um, movie company, she was asked to make sure that she, she wasn't asked to keep it secret. She was asked not to tell that she was Japanese. Now, as it turns out, most of her Chinese co-stars knew or probably knew that she was Japanese because she got better food, she got longer breaks, she had um, better um, quarters when they were filming, she got nicer costumes, uh, and she could speak fluent Japanese with all of the Japanese music or movie people. Um, but she spoke fluent Chinese as well. And eventually the, the family sent her to Beijing to go to high school where she could learn perfect Mandarin. When she was in Beijing at high school, her name was Pan Shuhua because she was sort of informally adopted by uh, a Chinese general who was a friend of her father's. So she is Yamaguchi Yoshiko, Li Koran, Li Shanglan, and she's also Pan Shuhua. After World War II, she moved back to Japan very harrowing tale. She was arrested by uh, the Chinese authorities. She was charged as Li Xianglan for being a, a Japanese co-conspirator, for being a, you know, a, a hanger on. Uh, and they were going to hang her for, uh, for being anti-China uh, until her Jewish friend who had lived in Manchuria with her smuggled her birth certificate into her. And she was able to show that she was actually Japanese and not Chinese, at which point the Chinese government had to give her back to the Japanese government. So she went back to the Japanese government. Her parents were still in jail in China. Um, they eventually did make it out. Yeah, so it took me months to figure that out. So I better tell you, her parents made it out. Um, and she, she paid for them all because she did become a, a major star as Yamaguchi Yoshiko in Japan. Uh, she was so popular um, and several American directors found her to be both very attractive and also a, a really good actress. She was. The films she's always been put in were so awful, but she was so good. Um, but anyway, they found her to be a good actress. So they invited her to the United States where she became Shirley Yamaguchi. Five names, three careers, more than five languages. In fact, there's a, a, a YouTube clip in which she speaks five languages fluently for you. It's, it's amazing to see her, right? So she's very transnational and a major, major star in um, pre-war, post-war, and, um, and wartime Japan. Um, and this song, um, I didn't give you a chance. Okay, so this song, this is from her most famous film. So I don't know if you caught it, but she switches between Japanese and Chinese there. And she does it flawlessly. And that's because she was completely fluent in both. Um, she was really a, an amazing vocalist. This, the movie is, is really difficult to watch and yet it's also a really good movie. Um, at one point, well, it's about a Chinese girl who gets married to a Japanese guy. And the idea here behind the movie, of course, is that give Japan a chance and Japan will prove to be a good husband to China. But China has to obey its husband. Okay, so we have this idea of taming. And what's really strange about this film is, is something known as the slap that was heard around the world. Uh, at one point, she's a, a Chinese waif. She's sort of homeless. Her family's home has been bombed out. And she really just lights into this guy who she has sort of fallen in love with and he sees her as a housemaid. And, and she just starts arguing with him and making him angry, et cetera. And eventually he turns around and, and says she's an ungrateful whelp and whaps her really hard. And the filmmaker 
was told this is not going to go over well in China. But the filmmaker, the director, told all of his Chinese stars, this is going to go over really well in Japan. And so they kept it. And when you watch it, it's really quite disturbing to see. But it sort of puts a, an exclamation mark on the idea of this film as a policy film. Now, Man A uh, says that they didn't make it as a policy film. But uh, it, it sort of has that propaganda effect. But it's, it's also a really good movie. And her singing is just beautiful in it. So um, it's hard to watch because it's so controversial. But she became a star uh, by being international. And she's still hugely popular. Um, this is, is Hattori Roichi, who uh, became maybe the most famous composer in Japan and internationally after the war. He's the guy responsible for bringing Boogie Woogie to Japan. Um, before the war, he composed for famous people like Aoi Noriko, uh, who is also known as a famous Enka singer. She was a Kayo Kyoku singer before the war. Uh, this is just her short Ame no Blues, or Blues in the Rain. She's famously contrarian, by the way. She really hated the development of Enka and um, thought that modern singers were, were just being too lovey to the audience, et cetera. So you can hear something here. They're using a five note scale, but you can hear that she's singing in a very low voice. And this becomes really popular after the war. That high sort of Li Xianglan voice is not as popular after the war. Um, and there's the Koga style guitar. So I don't know if you heard it, but very much uh, a change in the way that music's done. But this is the key song that changed everything. Uh, right after the war, this is the celebration of growing forward and uh, the wild days of not having to deal with government censorship and the difficulty of the war. Uh, this, this comes out in uh, 19, good heavens, I wanna say, does it give a date? Uh, 1948, yeah. And Kasagi Shizuko um, actually came to Hawaii as well at one point. So she's a famous singer. She was a jazz singer during the war. She didn't record because the government and other musicians thought she was a little too controversial. She, uh, she was, uh, if you know Takarazuka, she, uh, she auditioned for Takarazuka, but they told her she was too short. So instead she, uh, she worked for another musical company for a while, but they saw her as too wild and too jazzy. So she kind of got fired, uh, but Hattori worked with her and her voice is amazing. So this is Tokyo Boogie Woogie. And if you know the Andrews sisters, you'll know this song. So this is an encore. She's using such formal language. There he is, Yoichi. Did you see it? It's there, right? I mean, it's a happy song. It's kind of a bumping song. You can dance to it. That's it. 
right there. She's dancing. She's not standing in front of the mic and singing to you like this. Right? She's not going, she's like, she's bumping around, right? This is new. This is what young people want. And this is not what their parents want. Right. And so she's bumping around and she's got these dancing girls behind her. And this is mainstream culture. And this changes everything in Japanese popular music. And it comes from Yorichi Hattori's experience in Shanghai, where he brings it back to Japan and he can finally do it um, with her, with her voice and her style, and in a Tokyo that is no longer uh, under uh, the military government. Now, whether that's good or not is, is a different thing altogether, but it's a big change. Um, so Kasagi Shizuko is big in this period as is Misora Hibari, but I want to challenge you to think of Misori, Misora Hibari as someone you are not used to thinking of. We think of Hibari as the queen of Enka, but that's not how she started out. And it's probably not really what she wanted personally to be remembered as. She saw herself as an entertainer, first and foremost, and not really as an Enka singer. In fact, her first songs are really not Enka style. They don't hearken back to the pre-war days. They're not uh, nostalgic tunes. They're fun. And in fact, they celebrate um, Japan post-war. So this is, um, this is just a shortcut. I'm gonna go with the one on the left first. This is just a shortcut of some of her stuff when she came to Hawaii. Not all of the images in this are from Hawaii, but the, the recordings are from what she sang while she was here. So she was quite young the first time she came. She made a couple of films here. So this doesn't sound like Inca. It's not. <laughs> So she starts out as part of this duo. So he's introducing the band members. But this is the one I really want to show you. And this is the last video that I have. Um, so I'm going to play it a little bit longer. And um, it's, it's great. I want you to listen for her low voice. She was about 12 when she made this. And this is from the movie Tokyo Kid. And it's a celebration of being a free waif living on the streets in Tokyo. This is sort of a, a little orphan Annie, uh, if you will. And it starts out with her being discovered by a famous um, club owner that's who's showing up in the car. I have to see who this girl is. So, to translate, singing is fun for the Tokyo kid. So, in her pocket, she has dreams on the right side, and on the left side, she has a, has a pack of gum. And if I want to see the sky, I go up to the roof of the buildings. And if I want to go underground, I just go through a manhole. Soft shoe from Misora Hibari. She just repeats the same thing basically through the whole song. Whether I'm laughing or crying, it's all a relaxed time. Just taking it easy. 
So, long story short, she gets hired, changes her life, little orphan Annie. <laughs> okay, so this is a very different Misora Hibari than we see, um, you know, popularly uh, as the sort of queen of Enka. And um, she really did start out as a, as a pop music star and not an Enka star. So what happened? Uh, well, the answer really quickly is Koga Masao happened uh, to some degree. There is this tension in post-war Japan under the occupation of the United States. And the tension is really kind of simple to describe. That is, on the one hand, you have these younger people, some of whom, well, all of whom grew up through the war, but most of whom didn't actually fight, and most of whom are tired of all of the privation, all of the difficulty finding food, all of the problems that they experienced during the war, and they see the occupation as an opportunity to be free. This doesn't mean they're rich. In fact, for most of them, there are some very difficult economic choices going on. But it does mean that it's a new beginning. So the youth are interested in things like uh, Boogie Woogie. They're interested in things like Misora Hibari's songs, right? And they see this as new music for a new generation. But Koga Masao um, goes through this long discussion of why he finally, he was so depressed by the end of the war. He didn't want to write music anymore. Um, he met with a, a group of people and discovered that they wanted to hear his music and that he might be able to help people through the difficult times. So he wrote um, some new songs. And, and one of them was one that he didn't expect to hit at all. He thought that it sounded too much like old Kaio Kyoku, pre-war Kaio Kyoku. He thought that it was too nostalgic, that it was too sad, that nobody would want to hear it. And his producers told him the same thing. They said, this is, this is slow. This is sad. This sucks. Nobody wants it, right? But they put it on a record anyway. And he was blown away by how many it sold. And this is Yuno Machi Elegy. It is possibly the first Enka song. And this is one of the things that I contend helps to define Enka. That is, it's designed to sound like pre-war Kaiokyoku, allowing the adults who lived in the post-war period, who had fought or been adults during the war and lived through those difficult times, <clears throat> to skip the war, go backwards to a time when life was good, when Tokyo was thriving, when Osaka was thriving, when Japan was a powerful nation, when life was pretty okay. And so this nostalgic music shows up in this song and it creates the genre for the older people who don't like the music that their younger children are interested in, right? Um, so this is Yuno Machi Elegy. Uh, this is sung by a much more modern singer. This is Ishikawa Sayuri and uh, nobody can sing Enka like Ishikawa Sayuri. You can hear Koga's guitar. stop it there. Okay, so that's Enka. That's really sort of where it comes from. There's a lot more to it than that. Um, 
but that's the first Enka tune. And you can hear the beginnings of so much else. One of the key things here that you also see with Nakayama, by the way, is that most Enka songs are written by male composers for females. But this means that women are singing song or singing lyrics that men are, have written as men, right? So women often sound like they're a guy, even though they're not, <laughs> obviously. Um, so this is one of the key things about it, I think. Um, and, and this continues, right? In fact, the whole method of bringing in people and ideas from around the world is something that is a part of Inca. All of these people you see here are Inca singers. This is Cho Yong Pil up here on the right side. He's a very famous Korean singer. And in fact, um, he has helped make Arirang incredibly popular in Japan. So Arirang is, is sort of the Korean national song, uh, but it's also Enka in Japan. And it's really popular. Um, then up here on the left side, we have, I don't even see anymore. Uh, oh, that's Dick Lee, uh, Shanghai, popular music. Um, and then we have uh, Wada Akiko. Many of you might know Wada Akiko. She's actually Korean. Um, she's actually Japanese Korean, right? Um, and then we have Teresa Tang on the bottom left there. And um, down here, Agnes Chan. These are all Enka singers in Japan, really popular, who have brought their own national styles to inform the way that they sing Japanese Enka songs and vice versa, right? They've also taken Japanese Enka um, out of Japan and influenced um, the way that it's the Enka style songs are done all over. Of course, the Beatles had huge influence in Japan. Um, and, and I have to make a shout out here. One of my close friends knows the guy uh, who brought the Beatles to Japan. Um, and he's promised to introduce me. Um, this is, a, I had to put this in because I, I did a, a quick radio interview thanks to Deidre and I was asked whether or not there was a, a kind of a Woody Guthrie of uh, Japan. And this is him, uh, Okabayashi Nobuyasu, who was popular in the 1960s. Uh, one of his most popular songs um, was the um, Eat Excrement and Die song. Okay, sorry to put it that way. But basically, this song was a song about um, the education system and how bad it was and how teachers forced you to behave. And so it's all about how, you know, the teacher said, if you don't sit up and do the right thing and study, then you'll never get a job. And I told my teacher, go eat this and die, right? And, and the whole song was incredibly popular, right? Nobuyasu Okabayashi is famous um, on the right side here. This is his backup band in a folk festival that he appeared in in 1968, where like Bob Dylan, he electrified folk music and revolutionized folk music in Japan. His backup band is known as Happy End, and they are arguably the first rock and roll band in Japanese history. So again, transnational influences um, all over the place. And of course, this rock in Japan has gone all over the place. And although many of you may know this, I constantly have to tell my students that J-rock is not a thing, right? There's no such thing as J-rock. Japanese rock artists play rock, and they just play rock. Uh, in fact, the 25th most high-selling rock band in the history of the world is a Japanese band. It's a band called Bees, and they've sold more than uh, just about uh, any American artist with only a very few exceptions. So um, there are all kinds of uh, great things about Japanese rock. Uh, and Madonna, of course, has had a huge influence in Japan as well. I saw two Japanese Madonna concerts while I was in Japan. Um, J-Wave. So, I guess this is sort of my last thing. I, I, Scott talked about how I, I kind of study city pop. I study city pop because I lived in Japan in the 1980s and um, I listened to J Wave, which was a Tokyo rock music or Tokyo music station uh, on FM. We listened to it along the bay of Tokyo as we were driving in and out. And this is where what we call J pop started. Basically, J-Wave took American influences from American Armed Forces Radio, which is played in the clear in Japan, and they encouraged Japanese pop music artists to include English and to include American ideas of music in that song, in the songs that, that J-Wave wanted to play. So music that you heard on J-Wave was designed for an audience of young upwardly mobile professional people who see, saw themselves as international. 
And um, therefore, the music was called J-pop, not for Japan, but for J-wave. Right? So J-pop doesn't mean Japan pop. It means J-wave music. Right? K-pop means Korean music, right? But it was taken from J-pop. So um, this is a very different thing. And these are some of the, uh, the disc jockeys who are still quite famous. J-Wave is not number one anymore, but it was very famous. Um, Japanese bands took the idea of glam rock from Queen and they turned it into something that we call Visual K, which is way more extreme and really a lot of fun. Um, and then you can see uh, in the 1990s, J-pop, we really thought was gonna rule the world. Uh, until K-pop came along. So uh, transnational influences like crazy in Japanese popular music, but I'm only gonna play the Enka. Um, I'm kind of done unless anyone has questions or wants to hear more music. Thank you. Thank you very much. We do have a couple of questions. Uh, I'm gonna start with the Zoom question. Okay, sure. Uh, if that's okay. Um, someone wanted to know if Misora Hibari had any Korean, had, was of Korean descent. Not to my knowledge, no. This is a very common trope in Japanese um, entertainment circles. The idea that, um, that most entertainers are of Korean descent. And that's because a lot of famous performers have been of Korean descent. But to my knowledge, Misora Hibari is, is Japanese and not Korean. Yeah. Koga Masao had the same issue. Uh, that was one of the things that happened to him. Korean uh, residents in Japan came to him after the war. And they said, we, knew you grew, we know you grew up in Korea. Um, and we think maybe you're Korean too. So use your influence to help Koreans get better rights in Japan. And he had to tell them, I'm not Korean, uh, but I will help. And here's another question I know you will love. Was Eddie Chiemi an Anka singer? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Um, she did star in movies with Misora Hibari. And this is where the whole Misora myth gets kind of mixed up. Because like I said, I don't think that I'm, I'm putting myself way out on a limb here for Japanese Anka fans. I don't think that Misora Hibari is an Anka singer either. I think she sang a lot of Anka, but like, uh, Eddie Chiemi, I think she's sort of an all-purpose singer, but I think Eddie Chiemi is, Eddie Chiemi is really a jazz singer. She was phenomenal. Yeah. 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 In between everything, um, kind of folk, rock, Enka, right? This is the problem with a lot of Enka singers is that Enka can be anything if you classify the singer as Enka, but I think I would call him pop. Kind of pop. And can you repeat the question just so? That... Oh, do I know? Okay, Toshino Ikondo, and how would I classify him? Um, playing with the microphone. Yeah, so I, I think he's a pop artist. Or you could just, I'll just yeah, I'll just put it, just here. Put it there. There we go. Okay. It's made for that. It's technological. So playing, <clears throat> playing catch-up, Anka uh -huh. is what? Modern, popular music made to sound like an antique. And when did it start? 1953. <laughs> 1953. I, I think that you could say that, between 1948 and 1953. That was that bridge. Right. The people wanted to return to the past. Right, but not, not return to the war period. Pre-war. Yeah. Yeah, so Inca was invented to sound like an antique. It's like people who build Victrola record players now, right? They're modern, but they look and sound antique. Yeah, that's what Inca is supposed to be. Uh, Yamaguchi Yoshiko was born in Manchuria yes. and became a pop culture icon in Japan and other places. Another Japanese pop culture uh, uh, culture icon, born in Manchuria, uh, Toshiro Mifune, uh, also became an icon in other places. Did they have any connection at all, or did they know each other? Okay, so the question is that uh, Yamaguchi Yoshiko was born in Manchuria, and so was Toshiro Mifune. And did they have any connection or know each other? Um, it's possible, but I don't know, to be honest. Yeah. And that's probably just because my research on both of them is still incomplete. 
Yeah, so I'm sorry to disappoint you on that. Um, I don't know where he was born. She was born in Mukden and spent most of her time there. Um, but she moved around a bit, yeah. He did actually, wait, no, they did know each other. I'm sure they must have because he did films for Mane too, a little bit, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Do you have a visual of this kind of like time how it fits time? together? That's yeah. a great idea. I should do that, like make a chart. Yeah, we just did the uh, African American uh, music history museum. It's brand new and high tech, and we have a table, and each room, and you can go put on headphones and you can click and see the influences of that person connected. Oh, that's really cool. I should yeah. go see that. Yeah. 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 Oh. Oh, that would be great because, well, I mean, thanks to a lot of other people that, who I've read and, and my mentor, Christine Yano, has really been helpful that way. But yeah, that would be really cool, connecting all the Philippine and American and European influences. Wow, that'd be great. Great idea. And I have to go see that. I've been watching they have to call it Kabuki Cool. Yes, yeah, Kabuki Cool. Yeah. Is the music that we're hearing there, is that that modernized, Americanized uh, tonality? Oh, good question. So the question is, is the music that we're hearing in Kabuki Cool and by extension in Kabuki, is it modernized? And my answer to that would be probably no. I'm not an expert on Kabuki, but what I see and hear with Kabuki is not. Um, you have a very sounds and scales and yeah I mean I would I would um, be careful and say that it has changed a lot over time right the first kabuki performances that we know of for sure were actually they included women as well so kabuki's changed a lot and so has the music um, but yeah it's it's pre meiji most of it and uh, I I think however and again I'm not sure that some of the tuning of, for example, the shamisen might be westernized, but I couldn't say for sure. Yeah. But no, that's pretty traditional. We do have a question the whole way from Japan, from Nagoya. Oh. Yes, and that question is, what motivates your interest in Japanese songs um, in general, but specifically the World War II era? Wow, I could talk all day. So the question, okay, so that's online, yeah. Um, what motivates my, well, I could say karaoke, um, <laughs> which has been huge in my life. And I have to say the best karaoke experience I've ever had was in Omote Sando in Tokyo, where I went in with some friends and uh, I was surprised to see a young man sitting at a piano. And uh, he had a shamisen and he also had a guitar. And they said, what do you want to sing? And, and I named a song and he played it. And I named a journey song and he played it. And then they named an Inca song and he played. I mean, he could play anything. We had so much fun. Uh, so that that has always interested me. Um, music, um, fun with friends. Uh, it, it's just music has always been an entree into culture for me, I guess. And maybe our last question is, uh, is have Obon dances used Inca um, music recently so i think it's more of a a, a recent obon music is yes. it Enka? yeah simple answer yes yeah in fact especially in japan today you cannot not hear modern enka or even modern songs like pop songs in bon dances yeah. and even klezmer like i said oh right on the radio yeah well, uh, you'll be around to answer. Sure, yeah. It's always questions. fun to talk story. Thank you so much for coming. I hope it was interesting. Thank you. So let's give a big round of applause. Let's hope you can come back and bring your book at yeah, that time. I hope so, too. Okay. All <laughs> right. You. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, everybody on our Zoom audience as well. Thank you.